Hi, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us at the 2022 edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition of Contemporary and Modern Art. I'm Kate sears Batowski, Director of Programming, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on current issues that engage them. This afternoon, we present a conversation on collaborative printmaking with artist Derek Adams, Tandem Press Director Paula Panchenko, Master Printer Jason Rohl, and moderated by Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the International Fine Print Dealers Association. Panelists will also discuss the creative process behind Derek's new print edition with Tandem Press, commissioned by the 2022 edition of Expo Chicago, titled Silver Lining. The print incorporates abstract collage, vintage clothing patterns, fabric, and bold colorful forms to communicate Adam's interest in formalism, deconstruction, and fragmentation. Special thank you to our partner, the IFPDA, the preeminent international organization for fine art prints and presenters of the IFPDA Print Fair in New York, October 27th through 30th, 2022. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. Hello, I'm Jenny Gibbs, the Executive Director of the IFPDA. Um, first, thank you to, to Tony Carmen and Kate and her team back there for sharing this platform with us and for sharing it with our 14 members who are exhibiting uh, at Expo this week. The IFPDA is the International Fine Print Dealers Association. Uh, we are a, a professional membership group of 150 members galleries and fine art print publishers in 17 countries. And I've highlighted the publishers uh, who are exhibiting at Expo today in blue. And I've done that because that is really, the publishers are, are what makes printmaking different from other parts of the contemporary art world, studio art practice. Um, unless you're Jeff Koons and you have a studio full of worker bees and regular checks from your gallery, most artists are working alone in a, a solo practice and they bear the, the cost and responsibility of producing the work um, on their own. Printmaking is different. Um, there are exceptions to that. Kerry James Marshall has been making uh, prints alone in his studio, lino cuts that no one has seen, except for Susan Tallman, who's working on his catalog raisonné. Most, most printmakers uh, want color, texture, they want layers, they want glitter, they want um, texture, right? And so uh, that means multiple processes, and that means a big space with thousands of pounds of heavy equipment and people like Jason Rule who know how to use that heavy equipment. And that's where the publishers come in. Um, publishers typically um, carry the full financial responsibility for producing uh, a project which may be hundreds of thousands of dollars and take more than a year from the trial print to the final print. Um, IFPDA includes uh, two different kinds of publishers. Um, there's sometimes some confusion. Publishers can be uh, a gallery who commissions work. Um, the work that we're talking about today was commissioned by Expo. Uh, and they commissioned Tandem Press and Derek to produce this edition. Um, the work behind me is Christea Roberts. Uh, this is a work by Christiane Baumgartner. Many publishers operate their own print workshops like Tandem. Um, this is Borch Editions, uh, working on a gorgeous Julie Moretu. Uh, ULAE, some of you may know, this is one of the many decades of works by Jasper Johns that they've produced. Uh, they were, they and Gemini were sort of the pioneers in creating this, what we think of as contemporary multi-process printmaking. Uh, this is Two Palms, they're pulling a monoprint from Stanley Whitney. These are colossal woodcuts by Grayson Perry at Pauper's Press in London. Uh, and this is an educational program um, by High Point Editions. Um, they are uh, also exhibiting here today, and their booth is over there with a gorgeous Julie Moretu in it. Um, they are nonprofit, as Tandem Press is, and I wanted to just sort of give a special shout out to our nonprofit um, publishers who also run these educational programs. This is a program for middle schoolers. Um, Tandem is affiliated with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they have been training undergraduates and graduates for years. 
Uh, and so here we have this picture of the lovely people of Tandem Press. Um, and sitting next to me is Paula Panchenko, the director of Tandem. She has been with Tandem for more than 30 years. She is a past president of the IFPDA and the current president of the IFPDA Foundation, uh, which uh, provides direct support to museums, artists, and other nonprofits through our grants and award-making programs. And under Paula's uh, leadership at Tandem, Tandem has produced editions which have been collected by uh, the Whitney Museum of Art, MoMA, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, I could go on, the British Museum in London. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for that lovely introduction. Um, uh, I unfortunately always need notes, so um, I, I'm not a great off-the-cuff speaker. But I too would like to thank Tony Carman for bringing back Expo Chicago and for the brilliant work that he and his staff have done. And I would also like to thank Rona Hoffman, who is a legend in the art world and a treasure in Chicago. She initiated the Derek Adams benefit print silver lining for Expo Chicago in conjunction with Tony Carman, and approached Derek, who approached Derek Adams and Derek Adams approached Tandem Press. And we are deeply honored to have collaborated on this project. It's an amazing print and when you all leave here, it's out on the outside wall and I hope you look, on it, look at it and maybe even buy it. There is a Q QR code and you can make a reservation and it goes towards all the lectures and talks that have taken place here at Expo Chicago. I would now like to introduce Derek Adams and Jason Rule. Derek Adams, in my view, is a Renaissance man who is criti whose critically acclaimed work spans painting, collage, sculpture, performance, video, sound installations, and prints. His multidisciplinary practice engages in ways which individuals' ideals and aspirations and personae become attached to specific objects, colors, textures, symbols, and ideologies. His work probes the influence of popular culture, the formation of self-image, and the relationship between man and monument as they coexist co coexist and embody one another. Derek is also deeply immersed in questions of how African-American experiences intersect with art history, iconography, and consumerism. Most notably, in his floater series, he portrayed black Americans at leisure, positing that respite itself is a political act when embraced by black communities. The radicality of this position has materialized in Adam's work over many exhibitions. Derek received his MFA from Columbia Uni University and his BFA from the Pratt Institute. He is also an alumnus of the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture and the Marie Walsh Sharp Foundation Studio Program. He is a recipient of the Robert Rauschenberg foundation residency, which led to one of his most notable exhibitions, which took place at the Hudson River Museum in 2019. Derek delved deeply and fearlessly into the nooks and crannies of black culture, unveiling a nuanced wholeness of humanity. He depicted a world where joy, love and leisure, and even normalcy play central roles filling ma many of the voids and omissions in popular culture. Buoyant was the first museum exhibition where Floaters was debuted and we came to party and plan. These works emanated from his summer at a 2019 Rauschenberg residency. The list of, ex of museums that Derek Derek's work is in is extensive, so I am not going to read them all out, but trust me, they, it is extensive. I want to now talk a little bit about Jason Rule, who is a collaborative printer and our studio manager at Tandem Press, where he has worked for the past 16 years. In 2007, Jason Rule joined the staff of Tandem Press and was promoted to studio manager in 2013. He earned his MFA at the UW-Madison 
and following graduation, he spent several years exhibiting his artwork and teaching at several universities. As a collaborative printer and studio manager, Jason has created an extraordinary work ethic in the studio. Along with Joe Fry and Patrick Smicek, he enables the visiting artists to create exceptional and complex imagery and to reach new heights of print creation and experimentation. I am now going to turn this over to the star of our program, Derek, who will talk with Jason about the incredible benefit print, Silver Lining. You may wonder why Derek is sitting on one side and Jason is sitting in, on the other. It's so that they can both use the slides and look at what they're talking about. Um, so to start the ball rolling, I, I would like to turn this over to Derek and ask him to describe the creative process and the research that went into the Expo print and where it fits into the body of work that you have created over the years. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to be in Chicago. Chicago is one of my favorite cities um, to visit and also my backup city to live. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be invited to present and create a benefit print for Expo. Uh, Tony is a great guy and I was really honored uh, when I was invited through uh, Rona Hoffman Gallery, which I'm also very excited to be exhibiting with and working with since 2015, I think we've been together. It's been a great relationship. Um, and I'm very happy to now um, continue my work with Tandem. And Tandem, I would just like to say, it's been a pleasure to work with Tandem, starting with uh, the self-portrait on a float, which is my first uh, project with Tandem. And what I really love about working with Tandem, other than the, the quality um, of the print, which is superb, is the I can um, philosophy that goes with Tandem. And when I present an idea to Tandem, I never hear, no, we can't do it. It's always, yeah, we could do it. Um, and when I was invited to do the print, I really reflected back to my uh, ongoing series, Mood Board. And Mood Board came about in um, my exhibition with Studio Museum in Harlem that I installed in the County Cullen Library in Harlem, which was the home of uh, Madam C.J. Walker, which most people don't know, the public library in Harlem. Um, the research was based on um, digging into the archive, starting with Patrick Kelly's uh, legacy and in the, in the works that were um, stored there, as well as other uh, black fashion designers of that era. And from that, I began to create these mood board works which were collages that were in conversation with the arrangement of color and, and texture and design from these designers. Um, and it incorporates clothing patterns, vintage clothing patterns, and, and fabric, and arrangement of paint, and compositions that structured around the ideas of um, construction and deconstruction. So the, show, the first exhibition of the work, the mood boards, were featured at, in 2018. I continued the series, and it's ongoing. And most of my works are usually figurative. But I love to have the opportunity, when I can, to really dig into the mood board series, which is not figurative. But the clothing patterns are, are a stand-in for the, for the human figure, and that's how I kind of negotiated the transition between working with the figure and working without the figure. And Silver Lining, which I was excited to uh, make for Expo, incorporated an element of the pattern, which is the hem. And the hem is this kind of half circular uh, pattern that's found on the collage. And that kind of became the anchor for creating this image, Silver Lining. The Silver Lining, which is in the center of the collage represents the lining of the jacket hitting the floor around the, around the shoe. And so the angle of the, of the collage or the compositional structure is as if the viewer was looking from below a glass floor under a jacket of someone walking across a runway. 
and the silver lining is what you see wrapped around the shoe hitting the ground. Derek, I think uh, the next slide is silver lining. If oh, you want. bam, here it is right here. So um, when I created the image, it was very important to think about collage and think about some of the elements that are pretty um, much a stable in the conversation around my work. Patterns, polka dots, stripes, those things are really interesting to me and, and very useful in my language of construction because they play a, a major part in creating space, creating atmosphere, but also allowing the work to, to have a sense of activation um, through using various um, points of, of, of pattern that are both big, big polka dots, small polka dots, little stripes, big stripes, with really uh, large blocks of color. Um, I look at these works as are strongly in sync with uh, color block abstraction, um, hard edge abstraction. And coming with um, this print, I had the pleasure to work with Jason, who um, is amazing, and presented this idea of making this piece. Again, Jason said, yes, let's do it. And as you, as you see on the original work that's here, uh, the print, um, it has elements of collage that were created at Tandem. And, and Jason will probably go more into detail on the collaboration of the work. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Uh, and I, we did actually kind of say no on this print, just for one of the elements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But thanks for not saying that, um, <laughs> just because the, the pattern that uh, is kind of the main element of it that you talked about, yeah. I know that originally there was an idea of that being paper as well, but because it's such a large part of the print, uh, and we just were, we didn't think structurally it would hold if we did that as a collage element. So <laughs> luckily I talked and I was like, can we not do that one? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And I was like, thank you, thank you. So I'll just skip ahead to So this is uh, Silver Linings before the collage has been cut apart and added to the print. So there is roughly about 13 runs of screen print which make up everything in the center image. And then the two pieces on the outside are printed relief uh, on pieces of paper that are then cut out and collaged onto the print. So this is Patrick uh, Smichek. He's one of the printers at Tandem. He did the screen print portions of the print. Uh, and so I feel like I would be really remiss to not send a shout out to him because he's very heavily involved in this image. And then this is me printing uh, on the Vandercook press, printing the dot layers. And so you can see there that there's a plastic plate on the press, which is where the dots are, which will be inked up. So you have to ink up each plate individually and then clean the press and then move to the next color. And so this is just a kind of a studio shot uh, showing like the prints that have been, you know, they've been printed, screen printed at this point. Uh, they still have the registration punches on there that we, um, we didn't cut all those off because the other part of this print that, you know, it's, is kind of challenging is it's an addition of a hundred that we had to ship to Derek's studio for Derek to sign and then ship back to us. And so we actually shipped it to Derek without any of the collage on it because when you stack 100 sheets of paper with collage, they're going to get really, they're very difficult to deal with. So again, you know, credit to Derek to be able to say, we're going to send you this print. It's not going to be finished, but we need you to sign it. And Derek's like, yeah, that's, you know, that'll definitely work. So the, the, just the trust that's there is really important. And we really, you know, we really appreciate that. Uh, so this is all of the collage elements cut out, but not added to the print. And it is a bit of a misnomer that there's a, you know, a knife there because we did not cut these by hand. We have a plotter that does all the cutting. So they're all cut exactly the same. Um, so we can make a map to then add them to the print. But I thought it was kind of funny that that was there because then it looked like we cut them all out by hand. <laughs> Labor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so then this is just a shot of me with, it, it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's a, mylar that's placed on top of the print that has a map of where each collage element should go. And so these all have uh, archival uh, rag mount tissue on the back, which is a heat activated adhesive. So you t use the tacking iron, tack all these things into place, and then place it into a dry mount press and heat set everything. Uh, it's just a lot more manageable than working with glue like Rona, 
actually spoke to me before we got up here and she said, how did you not get glue everywhere? And I was like, well, we don't, you know, we use this adhesive that's just, it's a much nicer way to work. And so this is just kind of a close up of those collage elements. And that was definitely like when we, we got the image from Derek, we definitely wanted there to be collage on this print because a lot of the things that we've worked with with Derek in the past have had collage, you know, because it referenced his, his work. And so we want to have that integrity of the work and not just have a very flat surface. Like if you go, I believe Rona's booth has um, a grid of like 12 images that were done with a print shop that have its screen print and collage. And like the collage is just like a really nice seductive element that, you know, ties into Derek's work. So if you have a chance, you should check those out. They're really great. And so then this is the piece fully assembled. And the other part of the equation in the center, the silver, Derek you know, mentioned that he really wanted it shiny. And shiny is not something that print is really great at. Um, but we did do you know, silver screen printing inks. And then we also wanted to add a gloss layer to the print so it would add to that shininess. But you can't put it in a dry mount press once that gloss layer goes on there. So we had to uh, put all of the collage on collage it, and then add the gloss layer at the end. That's why you said no at first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we say no a lot in our heads when people yeah, like, yeah, reach yeah. out to us, but we, all, we, we try not to say no to anyone. But we, it's usually yeah. like we'll get an image, like self-portrait. Yeah. Like when we got that image, the first thing I said was like, oh, fuck, yes. Like I yeah. was so, I mean, yeah. I was like so excited that that's what we were going to do. But then I had to step back and say like, Oh fuck! We have how to many make piece, that print. How many pieces was uh, uh, that? So, so that's a woodcut puzzle block that has roughly about a hundred small individual pieces on that are carried on six different blocks that are inked up, put back into place, and then printed. And I also have to say that this is how I knew I think this would, it would be great working with Derek. I mean, the first day that he was in the shop, we tried to have a proof on the wall, just because when you have an artist come in it's difficult to start kind of cold. Like if you walk yeah. into a space and there's nothing to talk about, it, to me it's kind of a waste of a day or two of the visit. So we were, we were five of six runs into the print on Derek's first day. And the last, the last thing that had to get dropped was basically like the key image that was gonna finish it all off. And for whatever reason, that set of blocks, we, you know, it was woodcut, so it was, it was put into the sled backwards and inked up backwards. So we pulled this, which was supposed to be this crowning moment. Derek's here looking at it, and it's backwards. Like, it just ruins the print completely. And Derek's like, oh, that's cool. He's like, I know what it's going to look like. He's like, it looks great. And I was just like, why? I thought for sure he's just going to be like, I'm done. I'm out. Like, I flew all the way to Wisconsin, and y'all can't even print the, print the right way. But well, well, I thought, you know, um, a lot of these prints come from works that I create in the studio. And these works are usually works that are not exhibited. Um, outside of my studio, but these are also important works that I want to share with uh, with people. So I think that the works that we've created as prints from the original works that I have in my archive have been works that I really love a lot, and I feel like they're important parts of uh, stages in my creative development and my career as an artist, and I think that when I have opportunities to reproduce things and have them look as close to what I make in my studio, I think of Tandem as being the best uh, avenue because they understand the little nuances and, and details that I find very important to um, cap in capturing the work. So the silver metallic paint, which was really important about the silver lining, a silver lining has to be silver. It has to have some uh, level of visual seduction um, and that was really important for the work. And so these things, from, from going to Tandem and seeing the operation and seeing how serious the master printers there and the whole community, I just had the faith uh, from my first um, visit. And, you know, and also my really good friend, Micheline Thomas, works with Tandem. And if she works with Tandem, then they're on point because she doesn't take anything less than perfection. And that's what I love about her. And that's kind of my intro into Tandem was through Micheline, a really good friend, artist friend. And from that first encounter, I knew that it would be a continuous relationship of producing you know, very strong and professional images. And I'm happy to um, frame one 
and put it on my own wall when I get back to New York. So when I'm gonna, when you're gonna mail my, my, mail my prints. Uh, um, but yes, yes, it's exciting to just continue this. We have a lot of other great things in the works, um, which I'm even extremely um, excited about. But I think that every project that we work on together it has a certain level of quality that, that, ex, that exceeds the last in a great way. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would completely agree. Like, I think that each print is like a learning experience for us in terms of working with you and then just like what things work and what things were like, oh, you know, next time maybe we should try this. Like that might be even cooler or like, so I think it is, it's, it's great to like continually work with you because then as your work progresses, like it pushes us in, you know, different directions as well. It's always different. You know, the thing is about the projects we've done together, they always have a very different aesthetic. Um, the outcome is based on a lot of different um, techniques that are not, used in the previous work that we created. Um, like the style variation male figures were done with a, a very particular process, very different than the self-portraits on the float, which was done at, at the same exact time. Um, these things are really based on looking at the original work and thinking about how to translate the print in a way that does not compromise the, the visual output of what people see when they look at the original. And also, most people look at the, the, the prints that we make together as original works because they have the same level of integrity and quality and consideration with the collage elements added to the, the work, which I think most people look for in my work when they look at works on paper. They look for this kind of collage element mixed into the painting, which I enjoy. And I think we were able to capture it in a way that I was satisfied with, you know, and, and, and looking forward to, again, working on more things. Would you like to go back through the slides of the mood boards? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So this is an exhibition that's currently installed in Seattle at the Henry Museum, a two-person exhibition, myself and Barbara Earl Thomas, a great artist, local artist in, in Seattle. Um, this exhibition is a continuation of the series, uh, Mood Boards. Uh, the here is uh, some freestanding works and uh, some works on paper that are on the wall that incorporate uh, zippers, clothing patterns, and fabric collage with paint. This, this approach to uh, collage for me uh, has allowed me to really think um, individually with the construction of each works. In most of my works that, that are known in series, they have some kinship with the, like the compositional structure and the palette that I use. But in these particular works, I have the freedom and ability to really shift palettes, shift composition, shift things that are very uniquely different from each other through just kind of being inspired by the composition of the clothing pattern. That is kind of like the placeholder for these works. I look at the clothing pattern first, and I look at the descriptive uh, text on the clothing pattern describing what th that part of the uh, pattern is used for, and that, that uh, is the, the motivation for the compositional structure and paint pa uh, palette for making the work. And so they have a very uh, a unique and very uh, diverse um, output with the finished works, but they, the conversation is really more about, you know, the idea of mood or the mood board, the language that it, um, the mood board is around, usually in fashion, it, it kind of sets the tone. It's about the tone, the tone, the, the, um, the expression of each works. And so I was able to do that more using the language of fashion with making these collages in a way that really informs my other figurative work, my performative things, my sculpture. These are just kind of cleansing exercises for me. This is up also at the, at the Henry. Here I had the privilege of exhibiting this uh, work that's in the, the case alongside a Patrick Kelly original vintage dress that was loaned to the Museum of Scad Fash Museum in Atlanta um, for my exhibition that happened, that actually opened at the, at the beginning of the pandemic 
and the exhibition was closed for some time and they reopened and extended. But the great thing about this exhibition is that when, I, when it travels, I've been, I've been fortunate to um, get support from people who knew some of the designers who live in different cities, who, who collaborate with curators and the museums. And so this object was um, from a model who um, was friends with Patrick, who wanted to include it in exhibition alongside my piece that was kind of a homage to this particular composition. But for me, you know, it wasn't really more about fashion as it was about um, color and construction. And I really looked at fashion or the idea of fashion as a subject matter, not to talk about fashion, but to talk about the creative process that goes with artists who happen to be fashion designers. And I felt like a lot of these artists at the time when they were making objects, they were not necessarily put in the same level of, um, of pop, of, of, of commerce and the market of fashion in the way that um, black designers are now. A lot of these designers did not really get a break um, in the way that we look at fashion now. So for me, I kind of thought that they must have loved it. They must have been in it for the art and thought of themselves as artists because fashion at that time for these particular uh, groups of uh, designers must have just been about expressing yourself and getting things out and just really communicating with things happening in the social space. So that was kind of my motivation for tapping into black fashion designers of the 80s um, to make this body of work. That's the install shot from Scab Fash. This is also a great, great opportunity I had through Rona Hoffman Gallery in 2019. I was invited to, um, I was commissioned to create a mural um, on the facade of Fashion Outlets of Chicago, which some people may have seen. It's a huge mural, it's about 74 feet by 40 something feet. And it was uh, based on a construction, construction image um, translated into this gigantic mural. Um, and also while I was creating that, you know, the curator um, and the team working with uh, artists um, creating these images inside and outside of the, 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 the mall or the building, um, there also was a proposal for an artist to do the light fixtures. And that was not necessarily my first intention as a piece, but when I start to look at the wall, I really felt like I want to take charge of not just the wall, but I also thought that would be important to also um, have the lighting be in conversation with the wall. So uh, this particular piece is called Fashion Accessories. And so the chandelier like structure of um, the lighting suggests buttons and things that are um, applied to clothing. Um, and I think the large piece was called fashion show or something like that, if I'm correct. So I was really excited to do this in Chicago. And actually, the lighting company who created this um, structure based on my design is here in Chicago, which was also great because I had the opportunity to come to Chicago quite a few times to communicate and check on the prototype as we developed the whole, the whole uh, installation. This is also um, another version of the installation um, installed at, li um, at Live Arts in New York in the lobby. This is one of the fascinating parts about doing the archive research at the Schomburg where the exhibition was originally to be held because Studio Museum started this program called In Harlem as a way of, of transitioning from closing the museum to doing things off site. And so I was the first artist to, uh, to be invited to do a solo exhibition off site as part of Studio Museum solo exhibition program. And I was doing the research at the Schomburg looking at Patrick Kelly's archive and really getting into um, just some of the more ephemeral things that were in the folders. It was not any, f any clothing. It was really more about ideas that he was thinking about, things that ended up being uh, clothing lines in various seasons and in different, um, even in different countries where he was plotting different things that he was pr producing for fashion um, presentations. And um, also personal photographs, things, uh, correspondence with different people. So for me, it wasn't about making his work. 
for me, it was like, as every artist is becoming, figuring, figuring out inspiration, thinking about um, non-traditional ways of looking at source material and translating that into something that's more relatable to what I would make as an artist. And so from looking at his archive and looking at little sketches and looking at the way that he, um, notations of ideas became pretty much the motivation for the work that I developed from it. And um, unfortunately at the time, Schomburg was also going through a renovation of their gallery. So we had to find another space. And then I was so excited because the Schomburg is a research center which you have to, you know, you have to go in, you have to be at the front desk, you have to make an appointment to see things. But when I learned that the County Cullen Library was, you know, which I knew, but it was a public library and you can just, anyone can come in, you can charge your phone, you can hang out. I was even more excited about that, having my work in there, which is really funny. Most artists don't really want their work just exposed to the elements and just people who are coming in just not necessarily for art, but I thought that, for me, I always take advantage of opportunities that connect with audiences who are not necessarily in, in line with the academic um, community that, that I'm, um, I've been kind of indoctrinated into through my interest in art. I'm, I'm interested in having conversations with people who may or may not be artists or interested in art. So I was happy to install the work in the, in the library on the mezzanine. So you can see some of the works there. I was also um, able to borrow video footage of Patrick Kelly being interviewed for runway shows. Um, and that played also in the, in the library. So it was an educational opportunity as well as a presentation through my work. We were able to also uh, borrow um, some of the archive imagery from Schomburg and put it in the cases in the library to have some context for people who were not um, familiar with Patrick. Um, and a lot of the works in the series, although um, not directly from Patrick himself, because that wasn't the idea, the, I, the, the main focus was to how to translate the notions of being a designer, being a black designer, being a creative, constructing images, constructing things at a particular time. And that was my motivation as an artist to be in conversation with that. And here is a, a portrait to the right that I created of Patrick um, for his, like, his very um, iconic overalls that he would wear, um, which was, he was known for. I made a portrait and I actually incorporated a deconstructed pair of overalls in this uh, right side um, collage that the Studio Museum has in, have in their uh, collection now. And that's the entrance of the mezzanine coming up. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Um, Paula might, might want to lead off. We have questions from the audience. Um, and there. yeah, there we go. I have a question about the those last two layers that you, the last two layers of that, were they, um, how were those applied? Were those applied by screen? Yeah, the glossary was done by screen as well. Was it the entire of it, entirety of it? Or no, it's just, just the silver section that has the gloss on it. So how difficult was the registration on that? Uh, I believe Patrick is in the audience, and Patrick, would you say it's slightly difficult? Was it a problem, according to Patrick? <laughs> Thank so. you, Patrick. Are you just saying that? <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you for the talk, and thank you guys for presenting. Um, I have a couple of, actually a few questions. The easiest one is, where is uh, Rhoda Hoffman's booth? Like, what number is it? What number is your booth? 141. 141, thank you. There's and a wonderful Derek Adams in the booth. I'm happy to see it. And is there a DIY method to this dry mount process? Because I use a lot of glue, and it's nice to know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is you have to have, um, you know, you have to have something to heat set it. Like, you can't just use a tacking iron because, like, to, you have to have constant heat on the shape for a certain amount of time just to make sure it's adhered well. But, you know, they have, like, smaller, just, like, clamshell kind of presses and stuff like that. So it's, it, if you can't have access to that, another thing is called Goody, 
which is like a, a material that is pressure sensitive. So it's like a sheet and it comes in sheet forms and you can put it on something and then just like apply pressure from the top. And that works really well too versus a glue because I always find that like certain glues, once it touches the page, then you're done, like you can't move it. That's the thing that we really love about this is it's, until you hit it with that tacking iron, you don't have to worry about that. Nice. So it's called Goody? The, the non, yeah, the non-heat stuff is called G-U-D-Y. G-U-D-Y. Got it. Thank you. You're also going to use Double Tack, which is a photographic uh, film that people use to collage. In my, in my um, previous collages, most of the um, adhesive was Double Tack. I didn't use glue. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. And my last question is for you, Derek. Um, you mentioned that you have an interest in conversing with non-academics when it comes to your work. So my question to you is, how does that interest or like affect uh, your narratives and your and how you choose uh, source material? I mean, uh, uh, source material for inspiration, for instance, like fashion. Like, how does how does your or does it affect um, your your source material and points of interest? Well, I, I mean, the reason why I say I focus my attention on non non art community when I'm thinking about subject matter and presentation because I think that's the hardest audience because they're not as invested in the things that I'm invested in as a academic or as an artist who's been through the academic process. But I but my work also is inspired by a lot of non art people. You know, and and what's exciting about the way I translate or the way I'm able to translate things is because I always think about what they would think would be hot when I'm making stuff. Um, and for me, that's more exciting because I'm trying to translate things that, for the most part, what attracts me to the subject matter that I make, I'm always thinking about overlooked things that people within the community that I think I represent may not even think is that hot. And then as an artist, I think that I have the ability as, an, as, a, as a, a person who can imagine or, or using the resources of being an artist to activate and elevate certain things that may be overlooked because of um, the inspiration or the people who inspire me may be too deep in it to step back and look at it and say, oh, I'm making some hot stuff or I'm a part of a creative community. Like I think a lot of things that I'm paying attention to is because the education I had as an artist kind of fine-tuned my sense of observation to look at things that I may have not looked at before when I was not in an art academic space. And some of the art history that I learned being in those places heightened my appreciation for the things that I may have not appreciated within my community because they were so common for me to see and to be around. But when I start to look about, think about inspiration, I started to think about things around me and things that kind of shaped me as a person and informed me as a creative. And those things are just very simplistic things that I can incorporate into my practice in a way that can really complicate it or to highlight it or elevate it or exalt it in a way that even the people who are inspired by it can look at it and say, oh, I really understand the importance of what I've been doing now or thinking about now, or maybe just see what I think about it. Even if it's not something that they would think about and appreciate, they will see that I think it's amazing as an artist because I've dedicated these many hours and days into creating something inspired by that. So for me, it's an ongoing conversation with the community and the people that inspire my work. And of course, I love you know, being, having that work in spaces like this because it's, 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 it's a confirmation of things that I think are important as high, high, high culture. And so being in the space of high culture, um, bringing things that I think are high culture into this space is, is basically the, the, the finale of what I'm thinking when I look at things in my neighborhood, in neighborhoods that I frequent. Good afternoon, everyone. V.L. Harrison with Pigment International. We are a Black Fine Art publication. We yes. are in booth P4, my shameless plug. <laughs> it's 
so happy to be here with you, uh, Derek, and you're such an inspiration. Um, prior to this question, your answer just included a statement, communities that I represent. Yeah. So I really want to dig into that um, as we are a Black Fine Art magazine and we magnify and highlight Black Fine artists like yourself and Black Fine Art. What exactly does that mean to future generations? And so what are you expecting your legacy to be on the Black culture as we lean toward high culture? Um, that's a lot. <laughs> I'll give you some time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, one of the things about my practice and, and the focus I've I've kind of fine-tuned of my interests is looking around, at, again, at my peers, looking at things that are being produced, looking at the way people react to society, and finding a place. And I think that's important for artists if they want to impact their community or the world at large. So my work, at a particular point, I realized in grad school that the type of work I was interested in was really about a space that I felt was a void. And that was a space of just being a black artist, making things about blackness that was not based on being subjugated or objectified or oppressed. Mm -hmm. And not that those things are not important to acknowledge, but my peers were already doing it. And so I did not want to regurgitate things that I felt had no, um, no, no end in sight as being you know, not done. Like, I felt like these things were going to be done. They're important. These artists I know have created the spaces, but we need to really talk about the, the, the multi-dimensionality uh, of blackness. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, and also I felt like I want to make work that I know black people want to see. Mm -hmm. And what I realized as an artist walking into institutions is that the idea of trauma is not something that's foreign to black people. So coming into a museum and seeing it on the wall does not highlight or empower the black viewer. But to talk about the idea of normalcy and to be reflective in a way that black people actually want to feel walking into a space of leisure, which is a museum as a place of education and leisure, we did not have the benefits of, of, being, of having escape. Right. We did not have the benefit of being taken somewhere else as other viewers will come into a museum and see it because we're known as the truth tellers when it comes to installing work or making work about blackness. Mm -hmm. But these things have been happening for some time and the challenges are still there, but we have not tried something different. And so I wanted to kind of bring back some of the ideas that happened in Harlem Renaissance mm -hmm. with artists like Archibald Martley and Jacob Lawrence and you know people like that who just wanted to create this idea of black life as a way of empowering black people and being very, very reflective. And so I kind of brought those ideas into my practice because I thought that's a place for it. And I'm not saying that other artists should not make, other black artists should still make what they want to make and they should talk about what they want to talk about, but I think we should have multiple multiple categories of black experience to talk about. If you really want to talk about contemporary art, to be a contemporary black artist, we have to be we have to understand that multiple voices have to be heard and multiple ideas have to be er heard in order for people to really understand the multidimensionality of black experience. And that too was a lot. Yeah, thank you. Said that too was a lot. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Other questions? That's a good place to end. Oh, no? OK. Hey, Trey. Hey, so just to kind of uh, rift off of that last question, he, I'm kind of his legacy in so many ways. Because I look at Derek as a mentor and the things he's done for Baltimore. Like I Also my artist. Amazing. Uh, we coming. Um, but like, I'm, I'm very much thankful for Derek and the things he's done for the community. And he sets an example in that way with his work ethic. And I still internalize this thing that you said a while ago. Like, you got to stay ready um, so you won't have to get ready. And like, that's kind of how my practice is. I just keep working and working. And I love the fact that I'm in Baltimore and that things are happening there. But also, it's not a microscope on us. So I can just kind of live and make mistakes and fail. And you've kind of done that for me, like having these conversations, being here, you know. And so I'm a part of that legacy uh, of Derek Adams, if that helps. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. Derek, think, would, you, would, you like, would you like to tell people about your new initiative in Baltimore? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I'll plug that. Um, 
<laughs> well, not maybe like three or four years ago, I decided um, to create an initiative in Baltimore that would empower a lot of the creative community in Baltimore. Because Baltimore, at this particular um, point in history, is giving birth to so many um, amazing creatives who are in writing, who are in visual art, music, all forms of creative, out, you know, creative um, output. And I had the privilege of um, purchasing um, a large amount of property in the city and forming this uh, nonprofit called Four C's. Um, <laughs> but the idea of it was not necessarily, I had to create an umbrella and the, the cultivation, which is the umbrella, house these three smaller um, organizations. One was the Last Resort Artist Retreat, which um, is a, a space for black creatives to come to center themselves through uh, meditation, social gatherings, um, things that, you know, a meeting place. I wanted to create a meeting place because in New York, in places, other cities, they have a meeting place for creatives to come. Baltimore really does not have that for black creatives. In Baltimore, which is a primarily uh, a large population of black natives, are, are always can include. Um, they're always included in a program, but they're not the center of a program. And I want to center the black creatives in Baltimore to have a physical space that they can come to reflect, to talk about mental health, to talk about things that have to do with family, and have a space. So the last resort is a, is a space for creatives to come for at least a, a month. Um, to just relax. We, we have, we're going to have studios, but the, the purpose of the residency is not really to make anything, but if you have the itch, you can make it. Another, uh, another thing that I'm really excited about is I also decided, um, after purchasing the property down from the residency, a large lot, I, I created a proposal to create a Schomburg-like digital database in Baltimore, all digitized material that <laughs> residents in Baltimore, black residents in Baltimore, um, could scan their material, their, their family material, and, and, and use our space to deposit the material for safekeeping. We don't own it. It's, place, it's basically a place that you can keep your family's um, documentation that's digitized that you can have access to it from the past, the present, and even living that people can upload from your family from outside of Baltimore to keep a record of the geography of where your family started and where your family is going. And I'm very excited that I received, we received a, a $1.2 million grant from Mellon Foundation to create the operations of this space that hopefully will be built in a couple of years, but right now we'll be hiring local um, people in Baltimore to facilitate um, the actions of this grant. And the third organization is called Zora's Den, which is an organi organization of right, black women writers, uh, multi-generational, um, where women come together, some publish, some never publish, seniors to teenagers come together at UB Blake, a cultural arts center in Baltimore, to edit each other's writing to do readings with you know, public, uh, published authors and non-published authors, and they publish an anthology, The Fire Inside, which has one volume, and the second is coming. My sister, Victoria um, Kennedy, is the, the founder of that organization, and is, is now become part of the umbrella of this larger or organization, Charm City Cultural, Cultural Cultivation, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have a home base for this umbrella organization um, very soon. Fantastic. Thank you Thank so you. much. You. I, I love that your work a lot. Um, creates a place for an artist to be both serious and also able to express joy and pleasure, and that the programs that you're doing create a physical place and the infrastructure to support that. Um, and I think that's a great answer to the legacy question right there. I mean, I'm tired just giving all the uh, details of it. Like, I'm exhausted. How am I doing all this? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? How am I doing all that? But it had to be done, and I'm happy because the goal is I don't. I want it to be something that has nothing necessarily to do with me, as it's established. And one of the main reasons that I did it is because Baltimore is kind of going through this renaissance with the creatives, and, and I really want to allow the younger creatives to not have to leave, like I left to go to New York. 
I think they can stay in Baltimore and buy property and have these big studios and have these houses because the market is so reasonable that if we can bring some of the resources into the city, then the younger people can stay and they can be part of the building in the creative part of the city that I think is necessary. So I'm hoping, that's, that was my main reason for doing it is because I don't f want them to feel like they have to leave in order to thrive. And, and the way to do that is bringing resources to them. So that's the focus of this nonprofit. It's powerful. Um, and I think that's a good place to end. I'm seeing wrap up signs from the back of the room. Thank you, Derek. Um, <laughs> thank thank you. you, Paula. Thank you, Jason. Um, and thank you all for being here and for the great questions today. Thank you.